Hello. <laughs> Hope you guys are having a uh, wonderful Sunday night. I have meant to be on past few weeks and life has happened and things have come up and so I have not been able to continue on with our look at pigs in the parlor. Uh, next two chapters tonight are chapters 13 and 14, which is intercessory prayer warfare and um, a very disturbing chapter on ministry to children which let me just remind you again that this book is talking about deliverance ministry and this book is for Christians and I know I sound like a broken record but I have to repeat this every time because somebody new may be watching this and they may not realize oh it's pigs in the parlor it is a practical guide to deliverance is what this book says and it's actually made for Christians so it's um it comes with the presupposition that uh that Christians can have indwelling demons. Now, we know that we engage in spiritual warfare. Uh, and if you heard me talk about this before, you know that spiritual warfare is something that we biblically do um, engage in. Hello, Tanya. And um, so we're not, I'm not denying that. I'm not negating that. What I am uh, disagreeing with is that the fa is the premise that Christians can have indwelling demons that need to be cast out of them and how this book handles these situations. Now, with intercessory prayer, I'm going to jump into this, so I'm not going to lollygag around. Um, intercessory prayer warfare, in this book, it starts off, I'll, I'll read some chunks of this to you, and especially in chapter 14, I'll read a good amount of chunks to you um, and point out some things. And this is really just to get you thinking about this book. Should you read this book? Um, is it biblically based? I want to get you thinking about it and testing things because that is biblical to do so. So chapter 13, Intercessory Prayer Warfare. Um, they start off saying, what can be done in behalf of others who obviously need deliverance, but who are not open to receive it? This question is frequently asked of us, of those who wrote this book. Okay. So it says, first of all, what is the person's spiritual condition? Has he been born again? Is he backslidden? We must remember that salvation is deliverance. Now, the next few th sentences I'm going to read, there is some agreement with this. So the book is not full of every single word. Every single sentence is unbiblical. However, just because something contains some truth to it does not mean that it's something that we should be listening to <laughs> or putting stock in. So they talk about um, deliverance of a man's spirit before salvation comes a person is dead in his trespasses and sins they reference Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 um, in what sense is he dead we know he is not physically dead because he is still breathing and moving we know his soul is not dead because he is still thinking feeling and making decisions but his spirit is dead and we know Ephesians talks about that we were dead in our trespasses we were spiritually dead and Christ um, gives us eternal life he brings us back to life and by his holy we have the holy spirit dwelling within us at the moment of salvation the, his spirit comes to indwell us and we've talked about this before in other videos that we've done with this um if you feel feel free to go look at those but um and i also post them on my youtube channel by the way if you want to find them easily you can find them on there but we know that the holy spirit does many things he regenerates he conforms us to the image of christ he intercedes for us um, he, uh, he helps us to, to kill sin. So there's lots of things that the Holy Spirit does. But this book goes on to talk about, um, you know, that we need to be born again. John 3, verse 3. I would agree with that. This comes about by the grace of God through that person's faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Uh, Romans 10, 17. And salvation is deliverance. Now, yes, that is deliverance. But again, this book is, is going to focus on the fact of saying, but you need deliverance beyond that of, um, in the sense of you have demons that have to be cast out and the teaching is going to continue to be perpetuated. And it still is today by deliverance ministers is that Christians can continue to have these demons that come back. This is not in scripture, by the way, you do not see this in scripture and there's gymnastics that is done with with some Bible verses to try to get around and say, well, you know, this woman, for example, was a daughter of Abraham. You know, she's referenced this in the gospel. So she was a believer. That's not what that means. Um, we're talking about born again believers that have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, being indwelt by, by, de by demons. You don't see that in scripture. It's, it's just not supported. Now, do we have, are we in a fallen world where we face outward attacks? 
uh, that we can be influenced. Yes, but we have the Holy Spirit to help us and that we can renew our minds with the word of God. We, that's why we need to stay in the word of God daily. We are not left ill-equipped. We're not left ill-equipped. So these are things that we can understand. And there's a, a good website I'll refer you to. It's called got, gotquestions.org. It's a really good website to go check out. You can type in questions a lot of times there. And you can find some biblical answers and help you in your Bible study. And so I typed in, for example, I typed in deliverance. And one of the questions that came up, one of the questions that came up was, what does the Bible say about deliverance? And so the answer it says is deliverance is defined as a rescue from bondage or danger. And it talks about different biblical verses in the Old Testament of how um, time and time again, God delivered his people. It, this is a consistent pattern in scripture. And so the Old Testament we can glean from to understand the New Testament. So we see in the Old Testament, there's time and time again, God rescues his people from, from peril. Old Testament, he delivers his uh, people, from the Israelites from uh, Egypt. Um, he delivers them from the hand of the wicked. I'm just re reading some of the here. Um, he preserves them from famine, from death, from the grave. And um, in the New Testament, we see that God is the subject and that his people are the object of deliverance. And so we see in the New Testament, um, the temporal deliverance in the Old Testament serves a symbolic representation of the spiritual deliverance from sin, which is available, available only through Christ. And so we see that also it says here too, it says he offers deliverance from mankind's greatest peril, which is sin, evil, death, and judgment. And so I would encourage you gotquestions.org is, is a good, is a good, um, website. It's a good source to go to if you're doing Bible study and you want to look at other topics. It is helpful to look at it. So that's just some examples to share with you. Yes, there is deliverance in that aspect. But again, this book is, is going beyond the pale of that. And it's talking about deliverance as you, as a believer in Christ, if you are, that you still have demons that have to be cast out. And this really... Uh, this really paints a picture of just ongoing bondage. There's no freedom in this. I've said this before and I'll say it again. There's no freedom that's taught in this. There's no true freedom in Christ. And so the believer is always left, um, if reading this book, the believer is left with no peace, no freedom in Christ, no renewing of the mind, so to speak. It's just this, you know, all these hoops you got to jump through in order to get free. Um, so they say that the salvation of man's spirit is the first stage of deliverance and it is the basis for further deliverance. So again, this is giving the, the premise that Christians have demons that have to be cast out, that this is an ongoing process. So they say, so the priority in deliverance is leading a person to a relationship with Jesus Christ. If he is unwilling to accept Christ as Savior, then the ones who bear the burden of the Lord for that person's spiritual welfare should give himself to intercessory prayer and stand in the gap. Um, he should pray that the spiritual blindness be removed. And they reference 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, which I'll read that to you. It says, But if our gospel will be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Now, this chapter again is focusing, it's called intercessory prayer warfare. All Christians, they're not an elite group of, of believers, by the way, that are called to intercessory prayer. There's nothing in scripture that tells us that there's a elite group that's called to intercessory prayer. In fact, we are all called to pray and we're all called to intercede. Our prayers, though, don't save people. <laughs> God grants us the privilege to be able to pray. But it is not our prayers that save people. It is actually the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves people. We see in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then the, the Greek or the Gentile. Which if you're not Jewish, then I'm a Gentile. So uh, that would say be you and me. And that is the, one of the great mystery, the great mystery that Paul talks about in the New Testament is the fact that the gospel came to the Gentiles and that we are engrafted into Israel. We are engrafted into the vine as a wild olive branch. So we can see here that in, and even in the context of what this verse is talking about, our intercession doesn't change people. Because we see even in, in this sense that 
Um, when it talks about you should pray that the spiritual blindness be removed, yes, we should absolutely pray that. I'm not, I'm not negating that. I'm not disputing that. We should be praying. But it's almost as if this book is alluding to the fact that if you pray and if you intercede, that's where the power is because you are interceding and you are the one that has the power and authority. And so you're able to change people. We don't have that power. It's the Holy Spirit. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that people are changed. It's the gospel that changes people and the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel that changes people. Um, and then they say, you know, as the gospel is presented to such a person, uh, pray that the same God who commanded light to shine out of darkness will shine into his heart and that Jesus the Savior will be revealed to him. Um, I don't see anything wrong with, with that part. But again, we can't put on the all the authority and power on us as human beings. The power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ unto salvation. Um, you know, one can make the argument if you're putting all the power on a man or woman, then who's the savior? <laughs> is it God or is it you? Um, so we are important in sharing the gospel, but I think a lot of times there can be a false um, focus, if you will, that we're the ones that have all this power and authority and we're the ones doing all this stuff. And, and when really it's, it's God that is in the, in his spirit that is working on people that's convicting them. And we know, you know, we can see here, even from second Corinthians four, three through four, that it is Satan that is helping to blind people. And it's also sin. And this is one thing in this book that's really frustrating when I, when I read through this book is that there's barely any mention of sin. And if there's really a heavy focus on demons and that uh, people have all sorts of demons that are controlling them. And and if you uh, watched the video I did last time with the mass deliverance and some of the examples I showed, um, one of the questions I asked was, you know, you'll see in these mass deliverances, and it still goes on today, by the way, there are people that call out thumb-sucking demons, nail-biting demons, um, lip-biting demons, um, people think, chew on their lip or bite their lip, they call those demons out. And, you know, they go through this huge list. And I know to some people, if they're watching that you're watching this, you're like, what? <laughs> yes, there are people that do this. They get on YouTube and they get on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and they make all these videos or you'll find these old videos. And I shared some of these last time a few weeks ago with the mass deliverance. There was an old one from like the 1990s, I believe, by a man named Wynn Worley. And this man is calling out all kinds of spirits in this church and these people yeah, the sneaky squids. Yeah, really. And these people, it's really, it's sad. But these people that are believers, are it's chaos. They're rolling around the floor, foaming at the mouth, screaming, wailing. People are having to hold them down and all this. Now, do demons exist and do they indwell people? Yes. Again, a true believer in Christ, I would argue, is not going to act like that. That's not going to happen. And if a believer in Christ is rolling around the floor, hissing, slithering around like a snake and doing all this stuff, then we need to ask, is that person even saved? And that sounds really frank and really blunt, but that's the truth. Because a believer in Christ doesn't act like that. And if you can have an indwelling demon, then you have to, one has to ask, why in the world would the Holy Spirit cohabit with a demon in the temple of God, who we, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Why would the Holy Spirit do that and compartmentalize? It's not shown in scripture. So this is to help you. This is to help free people from this type of teaching. Um, so again, it's not our prayers that save people, though our, we are told to pray. We are commanded and instructed to pray in scripture, not just an elite group, but every believer is told to pray. We are told to intercede for our leaders, for our um, in in our uh, countries. We're told to pray for the the government leaders. We're told to pray for our leaders in our church. We're told to pray for friends, for family. We're told to pray for all men. We're told to pray for our enemies. We're told to pray. We're con we're commanded to pray in Scripture. But I hope that you see the distinction with we're given the privilege to pray by God, and that we don't, our prayers are not what holds the power. The power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit to convict people of sin, to call them to repentance, to change their heart of stone to a heart of flesh. 
That's where the power is. Um, and I would argue that we've created a false doctrine of telling people that they have all this power and authority that they don't really have. Um, and not really understanding who really is an authority and who's really sovereign in, in all matters. So the next part of this chapter is intercessory prayer. And they saw, they talk about how intercessory prayer is needed for the saved person as well. And yes, um, we, like I said, we all need intercessory prayer. This is another good topic to look on gotquestions.org. It talks about how we are to pray for people. It talks about how there's in the Old Testament that there was, um, you could, one could say it was a type and shadow of Christ being, he is the intercessor. Now he, it says in New Testament in Hebrews that he is at the right hand of the father ever interceding for those that belong to him. So for those who are in Christ, he is ever interceding for us. He is the high priest. And that should be, bring you great comfort to hear that. Um, so yes, I would agree with this. Intercessory prayer is needed for the saved person as well. And they also touch, touch on in this book about Matthew 6, 13. So I wanted to look something up. Another good reference I found is called BibleRef.com. That's B-I-B-L-E-R-E-F.com. It's really good. I actually think it's affiliated with Got Questions, and I just found that out recently. But um, BibleRef.com, you can actually look up verses um, on here, and it will give you several different parallel verses, <coughs> excuse me, and a commentary. And this is just one of commentaries that you can use, but it'll give you the context summary of that particular part of that um, that chapter. And it'll talk about Matthew 6, 13, for example. It'll break it down. And it talks about, this is the part of the Lord's Prayer where it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And some people in the deliverance ministry is trying to argue and say, oh, you see, you know, Jesus told his disciples, lead us, you know, to pray this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It could also mean that in the translation, that this means that, you know, we need deliverance from demons that are indwelling. That's not what that's saying. And so when you look at some of the, some of the meanings behind this, it talks about one thing could be deliver us from temptation to sin. Another meaning of it could be also be deliver us from um, trials. Temptations could also be trials to deliver us from those things that the devil brings and deliver us from the evil one uh, when we're in trials that he can, uh, the things that can come about because of him being involved in those. So that is something to think about there with that. I just want to touch on that real quick. Um, spiritual warfare. So they talk about spiritual warfare in here um, and that, uh, we are to engage in spiritual warfare, which, you know, there is again, biblical spiritual warfare and unbiblical spiritual warfare. Um, and so one of the things that they talk about in here is that Jesus, they say, <coughs> they say Jesus has given his church the power to bind Satan. Where is that in scripture? <laughs> I know that some, listen, I came out of this movement and we used to pray. I used to pray. Uh, well, it wasn't even really prayer, but I used to do that and bind Satan and, all, and there is nowhere in scripture that we are told to bind Satan. In fact, um, I think I've told you this before, but there's a couple of passages. One is in Jude and I think the other one's in Peter where it talks about false teachers are actually the ones that blaspheme the glorious ones and they don't know what they're doing. They're ignorant and they don't know what they're doing. And that's what scripture actually says, that they're ignorant and they don't know what they're doing. We are not told to bind Satan. The angels didn't even bind Satan. Michael wouldn't even bind Satan. When it dealt when he dealt with the issue of Moses' body, he said, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't bind Satan. And so we are not told to do that. So what they base this on in this book is Matthew chapter 16. <coughs> excuse me. I'm trying to cover my mouth. Verses, I don't know why, because I'm on video. Verses 18 through 19. So, uh, excuse me, verses uh, 18a through 19. And this is where Jesus is speaking to Peter, and Peter has acknowledged Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. Because he asked him, he said, who do you say that I am? And his disciples are answering. So Jesus answers him, and the verse that they quoted here, it says, Upon this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Now, they go on to say that because of how this is translated, they say that whatever we bind or loose on earth is that which is in a state of having been bound or loosed in the heavenlies. Thus, in order to bind and loose things on earth, we must first bind or loose them in the spirit realm. When you actually go and look at the commentaries about this verse, that's not, again, that's not what it's talking about. And even in the Jewish culture at that time, the Pharisees would have understood this, that binding and loosing had to do with forbidding and allowing things to, to take place. And so it probably would have very, it would have angered the Pharisees to hear Jesus say this to his disciples, that he was giving them authority as his apostles to say, I'm giving you permission to forbid or allow things and whatever you forbid or allow, that's already been done in heaven. So they were, they had carried that authority. <coughs> they did not carry Christ's lordship authority, but they carried the authority to do what uh, Christ, what Jesus Christ told them to do. And also too, when you look at this, I was looking on this one particular thing on BibleRef.com and then someone had asked about what commentaries do I use. I actually have several commentaries. So commentaries are really good to kind of give you more insight as to what's going on in that particular passage of scripture. So I have, I'm trying to think, I have a Moody um, the Moody Commentary, I have uh, MacArthur's Commentary, I have the Bible Believer's Commentary, I have Matthew Henry's Commentary, um, I think that's all I have, yeah, I'm trying to look from here, uh, so I have several, and then like I said, BibleRef.com uh, is another really good one to check out that's online, so that gives you an idea, there's quite a few commentaries out there. But it's good to kind of look at them and get an idea of what's going on to get different perspectives on that particular verse. And a lot of these people, they agree with what's going on because they've studied. They're scholars and they know the Greek or Hebrew and they can get a good reading on that and they'll give you a historical perspective on it as well to tie in. So I would encourage you to look at commentaries to help you in your Bible study. Um, so this has to do with... Uh, I have that book you have in your hand. <laughs> yeah, I would I would um, be cautious about this book if you read it. And you need to read it with an open Bible. Because there's some stuff in here that um, is really not based in Scripture. So I definitely would give a, a caution to it and just be any book really that you read outside of the Bible. If it's, if it's dealing with biblically based things, it's very good to have your Bible on hand so that way you can be making sure that what you're reading is solid teaching. Um, this has some, some pretty uh, serious concerns with it, especially when you're teaching Christians that they can have indwelling demons and um, you're not teaching them about what the word, you're not telling them, instructing them to, re to renew their mind with the word of God. And you're not telling them about sin and telling them about sanctification and making sure they've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, there's lots of things that we could cover with that. But the, the binding and loosing uh, that would have had to do with forbidding and allowing. Um, and I've read this in a few different places that this is what this was talking about. So when we set, when this author is saying, you know, we're given the authority to bind and loose. And so that also includes the spiritual realm. They're reading into the text is what it sounds like. Um, they go on to share this example here of intercessory prayer about this woman that had, <coughs> excuse me, this parent, these parents that had a 24 year old daughter. And it says that she was not married and she was living with a man. And she was also involved in spiritism and that she refused all offers to help. Uh, she refused all offers of help from her parents. So what they said, what they did was, they said together with the parents, Ida May, who is Frank Hammond's wife, who, Frank Hammond and Ida May Hammond wrote this book about pigs in the parlor. Um, Ida May and I bound the controlling demons and commanded the spirits in her to release her that she might receive direct ministry. Now here's the catch with this, okay? 
They said the girl was many miles away from us, but we were operating in the spirit realm where distance is no barrier. Where is this modeled in scripture? That would be one question that I would ask. If you hear, um, if you hear um, a report of this, where is this modeled in scripture? Because this, if you're talking to spirits that are demonic spirits, they're not even in the same room in a person, but you're doing it miles away and you're saying there's no distance in the spirit. You're misappropriating scripture for one thing. You're also treating demonic entities as omnipresent. Okay? Because I hope you can see that. There, there's nothing in scripture that we see. And if, and if someone finds something, please feel free to, to send it and I'll be glad to, to be corrected. To my understanding, when I read scripture, there's no example of the, even the apostles doing this. Jesus didn't do this. When he cast out demons out of people, he was in their physical presence with them and he cast them out and immediately they came out. When the apostles cast out demons, immediately they came out. There wasn't this hours long drawn out thing and having to get a bucket to vomit up slime in and um, this writhing around and putting a microphone up to their mouth. I know they didn't have microphones back then, but there wasn't all this dramatic theatrical nonsense that went on. And that's what goes on a lot of times. I mean, we shouldn't... The, it, it really... I don't know if anybody bothers anybody else, but whenever I see stuff like this and I see that they're putting microphones up to these people's mouths and they're giving demons the ability to speak. Jesus didn't even let the demons speak. He sh he told them to shut up, to be quiet. He didn't give in to that. He didn't do all that. He just cast them out and that was the end of it. <laughs> so there's a lot of this stuff that goes on that's unnecessary. <clears throat> so they talk about, you know, they're casting demons out and they're miles away. There's no premise for this in scripture. And the argument could be made that you're treating demons as omnipresent. They're not omnipresent. And Satan, by the way, is not the antithesis of God. <laughs> he is not the, act, the exact opposite of God. He's a created being. There is no exact opposite to God because he's God. Just things to think about. I know that, you know, these are even things that I had to, I had to think through coming out of what I came out of. Because when you're involved in stuff like this, you're told some of this stuff and you just believe it. <laughs> because you think that people are, you know, there's, you you know, it's, there, there's an ignorance to it and there's um, a, a naivete to it that you think that whoever's telling you this, that they're telling you the truth and that, they're not going to lie to you and they're not going to deceive you. And they may very well be the deceived themselves and not realize it. And they're doing it in their own ignorance. But some of these people live. People flock to the supernatural stuff. They flock to the demonic stuff. You put up a, a Facebook post or something that talks about, put up a Facebook post that talks about, you know, prayer or reading the word versus demonic deliverance. And it's sad because there's more people that are interested in demonic deliverance than there are about uh, being a student of the word of God or prayer and, and such. Now they go on in the same chapter of the, after they talk about this story, they say, you know, one caution, we must realize that we cannot control another person's will. Now I, what I'm about to read to you, it sounds like it contradicts itself. So see, see if you catch it too, because I read this paragraph a couple of times and I asked, I went, this sounds like they're contradicting themselves when they're saying this. So let me start over. They say, one caution. We must realize that we cannot control another person's will. Spiritual warfare has as its goal the releasing of a person's will in order that he can respond directly to the Lord and receive the help God is, has for him. In cases where the person is in the bondage of sin and of Satan by decisions of his own free will, then he has chosen, then he has to, Chosen that path, binding the devil will not cause him to turn. When the demonic powers are bound by others, he then has the ability to choose Christ and his kingdom. Now, I've read those sentences several times, and I feel like I'm a fairly intelligent person. I'm not a genius, but 
that seems like it's contradicting because they're talking about that they cannot you cannot control a person's will but then they're talking about that that per and that person has made their decisions they've chosen sin and satan by their own free will and binding the devil will not cause him to turn but then they go on to say when the demonic powers are bound by others he then has the ability to choose christ and his kingdom am i missing something <laughs> maybe i am um and then they talk about how which i would i would agree with this <laughs> that there have been people that have um, interceded for other people and that they've um, agreed to take into themselves the demons indwelling another person um, again a born-again believer who stays in the Word of God is going to know not to do such a thing um, and so this almost sounds like an occult type practice and so we ne we're not to be involved in stuff like this now, in the end of the chapter, they talk about the weapon of love, and they say that evil spirits are equated. They, they, they talk about basically with the weapon of love is that that is the one of the greatest weapons that you can fight demons with, with, with love. And they say evil spirits are equated with breath and air. Chapter and verse, please. <laughs> That's my answer to that. Chapter and verse, please. Evil spirits are equated with breath and air. And they, they make this correlation because the Greek word pneuma means spirit. That means spirit means breath or air. Hey, Stacy. So they say, just as carbon monoxide is deadly to our breath, so is love to an evil spirit. Um, our agape love forges a weapon that breaks down the anti-love powers in the lives of others. Again, it is not your power that sets people free. It is not my power that sets people free. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit. That's where the power is. And this whole thing of evil spirits are equated with breath and air. There's again, this is, this is a man-made teaching. This is extra biblical revelation. We have no idea where they're getting this from. There's no chapter and verse to support this. They're just basing it on a Greek word that's used um, <clears throat> for spirit that means breath or air. And they're equating it also to these evil spirits. And they're saying, well, then that also applies to evil spirits, to demons, because they're equated with breath and air. And this is why you'll see this practice. I've, I've shared this before, that they'll tell people to breathe, to breathe in and to breathe forcefully and to make themselves cough. <clears throat> um, I'll move on. Chapter 14. This chapter, I'm just going to prepare you right now. Um, this, this one really bothered me. Uh, it's the ministry to children. This chapter really bothers me because um, the things I'm about to share with you are disturbing. I think they're disturbing. Now, some people may be like, eh, you're, you're kind of, you know, blown out of proportion. <clears throat> I think it's disturbing. And um, I think that we need to uh, realize that though certainly demons do exist and certainly children could have demons. We saw, we see uh, 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 young people in the Bible that had demons that Jesus cast demons out of. Again, we're going back to the whole thing of this book that it's written for Christians um, to help them to seek out deliverance from indwelling demons. So just prepare yourself for this chapter, okay? <sighs> and I'm going to give some things at the end, um, some thoughts on this, and just get you pondering on this yourself. All right, so they start out in the beginning of chapter 14 with ministry to children, and it says this. Since it has already been shown that demon spirits are able to gain entrance to a fetus and to children, it is obvious that there should be deliverance for them. Now, where did they get their information for this? Because this is, again, this is not in Scripture. And for those that get irritated with me continuing to say, where is this in Scripture? You're just going to have to get irritated because it should be in script. Christians should be going back to the word of God for the foundation of truth. Period. <laughs> I mean, there should not be a dispute about that. So if we get upset because someone keeps saying, 
where is this in the Bible, then, then we need to ask why we're getting upset. Um, where is this information? And I, I remembered back in, on page 24 of this book, this is the statement that they make in order to make the basis that children and, and an unborn baby can have an indwelling demon. Okay? They say on page 24, Without question, the majority of demons encountered through ministry have entered the persons during childhood. Christian parents need to understand the responsibility to protect their children, as well as how to deliver their children from demon oppression. Now, I agree with the first half of that sentence right there, that that last sentence I just read. Um, but they will ask um, people how they related to their parents as a child. And if some people had a father that was an alcoholic, um, they'll go on to relate fears associated with this condition in the home. And at you know, at this point, there these people that wrote this book, they're making um, a correlation with this and uh, to say that there were doors open for demons to enter during a person's childhood. There is, you're going to find in this chapter, if you read this book, there is no mention of scripture in this chapter at all. And that was one of the, the observations I made. There is not one Bible verse even out of context, there is not one Bible verse mentioned in this entire chapter to support this. There's a reason for that because it's not found in scripture. So for them to make this first claim that it's already been shown, where has it been shown? They haven't, they haven't proven that their experience experiences don't prove anything proves nothing. And anybody who's getting their in their insight, their intel from demons that they're supposed to be allegedly casting out, I thought demons were liars. Why are we getting intel from demons, alleged demons? Again, demons do exist. And I'm talking about in this instance when you're saying that you're casting them out of born again believers. Um, so. This information is not found in scripture, okay? And we don't have any support that a fetus can have a demon, that a young child can have a demon. And they go on to say, D children are quite easily delivered. Since the real spirit, since the spirits have not been there very long, they are not as deeply embedded in the flesh. Huh? <laughs> like, I read this and I'm going, this is, again, this is based on personal experience. They're basing this and she's speaking as an authority on this. It's not in scripture. There's nowhere in scripture where it says, well, these demons come out um, not through fasting and prayer, but because they haven't been embedded in the flesh as long. That's why they come out much more easily. This again, this again is extra biblical revelation and it's man-made teaching. It's not based in, in truth. They go on quite a bit in this book um, <clears throat> to share personal experiences. So this is what they base all of this on is personal experience. So a few, and then I'm going to get to one and go into great detail about it um, to finish things with this. Um, they talk about having a young Christian couple that brought their three month old for ministry. Three month old for deliverance. Um, a four year old girl um, was brought for deliverance. <clears throat> Five and six year olds, they talk about, brought for deliverance. And then they go on to say, especially in ministry with children, it is well to remember the fact that it is not the loudness of a command that moves the demon, but the authority of the name and of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So why is it especially in ministry with children that you don't have to have a loud voice? I mean, why couldn't you do that with a human being? A, a human being. <laughs> they are human. Why couldn't you do that with an adult? An adult human being. Excuse me for saying that. Children are human beings and, fe and a fetus is a human being, by the way, too. Um, so, I, I don't... I, again, this is speaking... Them speaking anecdotally and they're speaking as an authority, saying their authority based on their personal experience. This is not based on scripture. Um, and I would also say too, and some people will disagree with me on this, but this is, it's okay. 
This is not a, a, a primary uh, issue as far as being a Christian. It is a very dangerous thing when you're dealing with people that may or may not have psychological problems. It is very dangerous for someone that does not have the proper training in counseling and therapy, regardless of what your thoughts are on secular um, counseling, even in biblical Christian counseling. Um, it is dangerous to be counseling people like this and you don't have the proper training in these areas. This is dangerous. Um, and it's irresponsible to be doing this. So what I'm about to read to you here in just a moment, again, is going to be disturbing. So I'm just preparing you um, so you'll know what's going on. Um, and then they talk about how, how do infants, they pose this question, how do infants and children keep themselves free from the demons once they are delivered? How do they keep themselves free? See, this goes back to a works-based salvation. Um, yes, I would agree, Mia. Everything is not a demon. Um, this goes back to a works-based salvation. So just like they're telling Christians in here, oh, you can have demons and you need to do this, this, and this to keep yourself free. Rather than trusting in the Lord renewing your mind with the word of God, following his instructions, understanding what true sanctification is and being led by the spirit, resting in Christ, trusting in Christ for your salvation, the joy of the Lord. Like, why are we not taking people back to the Bible? <laughs> why, is the, why is the gospel, why is the word of God not sufficient to train us up in righteousness and to instruct us and correct us and reprove us and rebuke us? Why is it not sufficient? It is, but to these people, it's not, it's not sufficient. And what you do is you perpetuate more bondage in people. And then they, they need to buy your books. They need to continue to buy your books and they need to continue to buy your DVDs and they need to continue to sow into your ministry because if they don't sow into your ministry, then they're not going to get healed. And there are people out there that are saying stuff like that. Guaranteed. There are people that are saying that in deliverance ministries that if you sow a seed, that it will seal your deliverance. That is not scriptural. It's not. So they say to this question, they say it is not the responsibility of the child, but of his parents or guardians. Now, parents, you and I, if you're a parent, you and I both do have a responsibility to our children to teach them the ways of the Lord and to tell them the truth about who God is and what scripture says about God and the gospel. We do have a responsibility in that. We're not off the hook. But to say that it is, uh, to not even say that in there, to say, hey, parents, you need to be teaching your, your children the word of God. You need to teach them about the, they need to hear the gospel at a young age. So that way, they're, that they're given that opportunity to hear the gospel and come to Christ. There's no mention of that. So it's just this, well, how do infants and children keep themselves free from demons? What's well, not the responsibility of the child, but of the parents or grandparents? So then it's placing the burden on the parents or, or guardians to say, oh, well, you know, I have to keep them free. So what do I need to do to keep them free? Well, I need to keep taking them to deliverance sessions so that demons can be cast out of them. They can be restrained and they can be made to throw up and they can have all these manifestations happen. And then we can make it seem like that it was a, that they really need deliverance when maybe they needed some discipline. <laughs> maybe they needed some correction and they needed proper discipline in their home to know how to act. Or my goodness, I mean, these people taking their three month old baby for deliverance. Are you kidding me? You've got to be kidding me. Oh, it's just, this is, this chapter, this chapter bothered me. <laughs> it bothered me so much. Okay, so let's get on with it. So this is this is the last part, and this is it's a good little chunk, so just bear with me. So they talk about this story in here. It's a following account, and Ida Mae Hammond is the one that, that talks about it because she was the one that dealt with this child's deliverance is what she talks about. Now, we have to go on their word. We don't know if this really happened or not, if this is being embellished, exaggerated. We don't know. We're just ba we just have to go. If you're reading this book and you take stock in it on Pigs in the Parlor, then you're having to, to trust them that what they're telling you is the truth and that you are fully sold into this doctrine lock, stock, and barrel. 
So they talk about the most graphic child deliverance, is Ida Mae Hammond relaying this, the most graphic child deliverance I ever had was that of a six-year-old girl. And they changed her name to Mary. And Mary's father uh, came to them for deliverance. And um, he was having difficulty handling his daughter, six-year-old child. Have you all ever had problems? I have a six-year-old. Have you all ever had problems with a six-year-old child? Have you ever had problems with a five-year-old child? You ever had problems with a four-year-old child? How about a three-year-old? How about a two-year-old? How about a little boy that's not even two yet? I'll raise my hand for that one. Okay? He's almost two. He doesn't have a demon if he's throwing a fit. It's called, some people call it terrible twos. My, our daughter went through like more like the terrible threes and having to work through that and tantrums and things. And learning how to pro provide proper correction and discipline and dealing with every child differently and knowing how to talk to them and to not escalate the situation and to do it in a, in a proper way. And that's not with casting demons out of them. Ugh. How about we talk about sin? How about we talk about that children are born into sin? They're sinners. And that's the problem. And that they need to hear the gospel. Every person needs to hear the gospel. How about we go that route? But that's not popular. It doesn't sell books and it doesn't get you on certain TV shows or... or... Never mind. I'll stop. Um, so anyway, so he talks about how the husband, this, this father talks about how he, he had recently gotten divorced. He was raising the little girl. He said that she was most difficult, a most difficult child to handle being very stubborn, self-willed and rebellious. Wow. That's really atypical for a six year old, isn't it? He was quite, <clears throat> or for a young child to be dealing with stubbornness and rebellion and having to try to correct them. Right. He was quite concerned since her nature caused him to become so excessively angry that he would punish her too severely. Well, that sounds like that the father needs some self-control and he needs to be corrected by the word of God. And all of us have had been in that situation at one point or another where we're a parent or just being a human being. All of us have been in a situation where we need correction. And the Bible is where we need to go for that. The instruction from the word of God as Christians. <clears throat> We told him that the girl needed as much deliverance as he, if not more, and insisted that he bring her to us. So uh, a few days later, he brought her directly from school. Um, and uh, and uh, Ida Mae says that she was getting acquainted with the little girl and explaining to her that she wanted to pray for her. And she makes this, this remark and says that the girl drank about half a thermos of orange juice. Now, this is going to be relevant according to Ida Mae in a little bit. But she talks about how she drank half a thermos of orange juice because if you've been around these deliverance ministries long enough, I'll just tell you that one of the things that they encourage to do is throwing up, cough it up, up and out, you know, puking up a demon or spitting out slime or doing something to make sure that to verify, to show, oh, yep, there's a demon because you did this. Again, this is not in scripture. This is not a practice in scripture. Mm, okay. Um, said she in the and Ida Mae says she was very hyperactive, jumping on and off the church pew, absolutely unable uh, due to restlessness to sit while we chatted. So um, she said that she told Mary. Um, she said, "Mary, your father tells me that you know there are bad spirits." And her eyes widened and she began to tell me very seriously how every night she had to make sure all the doors were locked before she could go to bed. When she got up in the night to get a drink or go to the bathroom, she was afraid and had to know personally that all doors were securely locked. And I said, yes, that is fear, Mary. You have demons of fear in your body. She told this little girl, this six-year-old girl, <clears throat> that she had demons in her body. Demons of fear. In her body. She said, they make you afraid and I want to pray for you and make them leave your body. They have gotten inside you and when I pray, they will come out of your mouth and leave. She accepted my words with simple childlike faith. 
So then Adame said, <clears throat> excuse me, Adame asked her to come sit down on the bench beside her while she prayed. And she said she did, but she was so restless that I had to take her on my lap to keep her near me. She sat on my lap with her back toward me. I began to pray a prayer of faith and trust that Jesus was going to set her free. The Holy Spirit very plainly told me to keep my voice very quiet, lower than a conversational tone. Also to consider every word hereafter, listen to this, also to consider every word hereafter that came out of Mary's mouth to be a demon speaking or to be demon inspired. I told you that this chapter was disturbing. So then Ida Mae says that she began to address the demons. She said, now you demons indwelling Mary's body, again, a six-year-old girl, I want you to know that Mary is covered by the blood of Jesus through her father's relationship to Jesus. Let me stop here for a second and let me say something real quick. Our children cannot be saved because we are. That's not how that works. Every single person is to give an account before God. Our children are not saved by association. They're not saved because their mom and dad are saved. They come to saving faith in Christ individually. And they must hear the gospel in order to do so. And in order for the Holy Spirit to, to do a work in them. <clears throat> And to transform them. So this, I do not agree with this statement right here that, that, that she just said. I want you to know that Mary is covered by the blood of Jesus through her father's relationship to Jesus. She then uh, goes on a little bit further and she says, Demons, I also want you to know that Mary's father has heard and accepted the truth of God's word concerning you, demon spirits. He knows now that it is you he has been struggling against and not Mary. So again, we are not addressing, this is not addressing here that, that Mary, the six-year-old girl, is, is a sinner and that she needs to hear the word of God. She's not saved by osmosis because her father is saved and we don't even know if he's truly saved or not. We don't know if he's really heard the gospel. We don't know what, what his profession of faith is and, and <clears throat> what he believes. We're just again going by what this book tells us. Anime says, I became aware that Mary was whispering and leaned around to see if I could catch what she was saying. She was whispering, I don't like what you were saying. I replied, I know you don't like it, demons, because I am exposing you and I have knowledge of you. Mary has been tormented by you from before she was born. So, again, putting this idea in her mind that she has had demons since she was a fetus. This is nowhere in scripture. Nowhere. While she was still in her mother's womb, some of you entered her, but God has said you cannot indwell her body any longer. Again, the demon in Mary, because again, Adame has already set it up that the Holy, she said, according to her, the Holy Spirit told her from hereafter, whatever comes out of Mary, you assume that it's demons talking. She said, the demon and Mary began to whisper, this time in a very tight-jawed, defiant words, they protested, I don't like what you are saying. So she said she kept her voice quiet um, and said, it's not going to get any better for you, demon, but worse because you are going to be cast out of her today. You are losing your home. At this, the demon screamed out and again retorted, I don't like what you are saying. Now shut up. I replied, no, I shall not shut up, but rather will continue to talk until you are out of her body. And then Adame says she continues to go on speaking to the demons um, and she, she addresses them one by one, um, that they start manifesting themselves. You start, she tells them, you start manifesting yourselves. Is that necessary? Did Jesus tell, did the apostles tell people to start manifesting their demons in order to prove that they were there? And she said that Mary began to say in a whisper, you don't love me. If you did, you wouldn't be holding me. And she said, that's right, rejection demon. You need to come out. And she said the demons were making Mary struggle. Now, this was another part that really bothered me. <clears throat> she 
said, the demons were making Mary struggle to get out of my lap, although I was still able to hold her rather loosely in my arms. Eventually, I had to resort to putting one of her legs between mine, thus holding her in a vice and bodily restraining her. A six-year-old. And then she said, the demon of hate put her face right up in my face with our noses touching and screamed, I hate you. So she said, come out, demon of hate. And she said, the little girl was asking for a knife. I want a knife. Again, we don't know if this really happened or not. And I, I know people won't like hearing this, but you cannot put it past people to exaggerate and embellish or even concoct these whole stories. We have no clue if this is true or not. And if it is true, this is disturbing. That someone is, that a father is being told that his six-year-old daughter has demons and needs all this deliverance done. And telling the little girl, you've had demons since you were a fetus, since you were in your mother's womb, you've had demons. No proof. And a six-year-old's going to believe that. So then she said that she cast out the demon of murder. I command you to come out in Jesus' name. And then Mary stood up and threw her shoulders back and placed her hands on her hips and retorted, nobody ever tells me what to do. And Ida Mae said, I said, defiance, you come out. And then she said there was a change in her voice. And um, then she said that the little girl said, I only do what I want to do. And she said, the, the self-will demon come out. Self-will demon come out. And then there was another change in her voice. And then she said that, uh, the demon said, you will never make me come out. And, uh, Adame said, stubbornness, you have to come out too. And Mary raised her hands like claws and lunged for her face and her eyes were protruding and she was screaming. And she said, madness, you come out of Mary in Jesus name. And she began to claw, claw her hair and shake her head violently. And she said, mental illness and insanity in a six year old. Mental illness and insanity come out. And I call for the spirit of schizophrenia. Now, there's a whole chapter on this, by the way. I think it's chapter 21. So it's going to be a little bit before I get to that. That, I can't even right now. Um, the spirit of schizophrenia. You demons of schizophrenia, I call your hand. You bring out your two opposite personalities, which you are establishing in her. One of you is rooted in rejection and self-pity. I thought she already cast out rejection. I thought that was the first one that she cast out. What is this? Um, and, and the other is rooted in rebellion and bitterness. Neither one of those personalities is the real Mary. I release and loose the real Mary to be what Jesus wants her to be. She can't without the gospel. <laughs> and this ain't the gospel, y'all. This ain't the gospel. I'm getting high pitched. I'm so sorry. So with this, she said, the little girl clawed violently at her, scratching her arms and lunging for her. She bit a hole in her blouse. And she said that when Mary came up, that, that Mary kind of had this shocked look on her face and that she looked like she was expecting to, to get slapped across the face, is what she said. And she said, I could tell it was the real Mary who was startled. And I addressed the demons and said, no demons, I shall not harm Mary for ruining my blouse because I can separate her from you. Too long, Mary, has been punished in her flesh for the things you have done through her. You demons have gone virtually untouched. It's different today. You demons are taking the punishment, and Mary goes free. And Mary looked relieved for a second, and then the other demon began manifesting themselves. Other demons. So then she says, finally, after about 20 or 30 minutes of this deliverance procedure, Mary began to scream, one long scream after another. Well, she's wearing this girl out. 20 to 30 minutes? I mean... Can you get a six-year-old, how long can you get a six-year-old to sit still and keep your undivided attention? She's wearing this child out physically. So Mary began to scream, one long scream after another, and begged to be turned loose. She would say, don't hold my leg, don't hold my leg. The Holy Spirit gave me understanding that her flesh was now stirred up 
and that I should release her and have her sit on the bench beside me. I instructed, Mary, I'm going to let you sit on the bench, okay? She was crying softly and said, I don't like for you to hold me like that. I said, well, I'm sorry I had to hold you so tight, but the bad spirits were making you fight me. And Ida, say, Ida Mae says, I was always careful to put the blame on the demons. In her childish way, she seemed to appreciate that, that they were finally catching the blame instead of herself. So she said, Mary sat beside her for a while, and Ida Mae said, the Holy Spirit told me that I should now give the command quickly for the remaining demons to come out. I mean, this woman has alleged to, to cast out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten demons out of this child already. And now she's trying to say that there's more demons that need to come out. And so she says, now in the name of Jesus, I command all demon spirits remaining in Mary to come out. Why don't they just do this in the beginning? That's, th here's the thing. Why? Why go through all this? Why? Why not just, if someone truly had that many demons in them, why don't you just say, out now in Jesus' name? This is just, I'm sorry, guys. I hate, I really don't, I don't like having a bad attitude about stuff like this. This really, it just, it's so troubling. It's so troubling. And it just seems like it's, it's embellished in order to make it more um, justified and to make it more legitimate. And I just cannot get away from the fact that it's based on a six-year-old child and, and people think this book is great and they have no problem with this. We've got to get back to the Word of God. It's, it is ever more clear when reading stuff like this that to get back to Scripture, to the Word of God, to the truth of the Word of God, and to understand what true freedom in Christ really is. Because you're not going to find it in this book. So Ida Mae says she commands all the remaining demons to come out of Mary. And immediately Mary became sick in her stomach. And before I could reach a paper towel, she threw up a large ball of slime. So she makes this point that, you know, 30 minutes, uh, she talks about that, uh, well, prior to that, that that uh, Mary had drank this whole thermos of orange juice. And so there was no way that there, there was not a trace of the orange juice that she threw up. None of the slime came from her stomach. Liquids usually, um, at least I know this in animals to be the case, and it depends on cats, it tends to be a little quicker. Usually things that are in your uh, stomach leave within an hour. Sometimes sooner, depending on the, the animal. I don't know what it is in humans, but especially with a liquid, it would probably vacate fairly quickly. So the, she's trying to make the point that, oh, there was no orange juice that, that was thrown up here. It was just this slime stuff, and so it had to be supernatural. It had to be a demon. No. And she says at the end that, that uh, Mary, that the reports that she had heard on Mary ended up being good, that she ended up being, um, that she wasn't the same, that she, uh, that she was uh, so much, she was so different, so much better. And um, again, we have no, we have no clue. We have no way of knowing if that's true or not. No way. So that was the end of that. Thank goodness. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be a good book if it didn't have all the demons in it. Um, so there was the chapters on intercessory prayer, warfare, and ministry to children. So I'll hopefully I'll be uh, getting on here again very soon. And um, the next chapters will be binding and loosing. And then um, pros and cons to techniques and methods. Oh, usually two chapters at a time. This has been painful. <laughs> this is so painful doing this book. Um, but I want to try to help other people to, to test things against scripture. And again, that whole chapter, ministry of children, not one mention of scripture in there at all. I mean, there's been scripture in other chapters and there's been a lot of times that the scripture is misappropriated, meaning that it's not in the tech context of what they're saying that it means for their teaching. There was no scripture in there for the ministry to children. 
And that should be troubling. That should be a telltale sign to you when someone is basing it all on experience and they're telling you that, you know, they, they held this little girl like a vice between their legs and that they're saying all this stuff and they've already prepped her. They prepped her ahead of time to say, you have these demons. This is what you have. You know, the reason why you want to lock your doors at night and do all this stuff is because you have fear because of demons. You have demons dwelling in you and they've been in you since you were in your mother's womb and that you need, you need to have these demons cast out. Notice there was no mention of saying, um, has your dad ever told you about the gospel? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the word of God says. Um, now I just started on there, Stacy, so I don't have enough, but I, um, I'm going to be using it for ministry purposes. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I had kind of reserved, I held off doing TikTok, but, um, I decided to go ahead and do it for ministry purposes, so I'll be doing it on there. So no, just it's just small. So we'll see. But um, anyway, I hope that that's been helpful. Um, please, guys, please uh, be leery of books like this. Please test them against Scripture. I don't care how many followers somebody has. I don't care how many years they say they've been in ministry doing this stuff. I don't care how many how many TikTok followers they have. I don't care how many YouTube subscribers they have, how many Instagram followers, Facebook followers. It does not matter what they, they need to be teaching what's biblically based. And if they're appealing to their experiences all the time and they're telling you all these outlandish stories and they're, they're conversing with demons on microphones and they're doing all this this theatrical stuff and they're commanding the demons and they're making it, they're trying to have false humility and say, well, you know, it's all about Jesus and him being glorified. But then they're saying, look at the power that I have because I'm standing here doing this. Please test these things against scripture. Test what I'm saying against scripture. I don't know everything. There may be things that I say to you that may, uh, that I, Obviously, I don't have my Bible memorized, but I do enough studying to, to get a good kind of a pulse on this stuff and to say, yeah, that's not in Scripture. But also, I'm not above being corrected. So if someone were to send me something and they found it in Scripture and it's the right context, I'll be happy to, to say, yeah, I was wrong about that. I didn't know that that was there and I need to, to, to correct this situation and to admit that I didn't know this. They provided no, zero, zero scripture for, for delivering children because it's not in the Bible the way they said it. They're basing it on personal experience. And it's just disturbing. It's disturbing. So thanks guys for hanging with me tonight on this Sunday night. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys again soon and uh, we'll continue on. I'll be, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to be glad when this book is done. <laughs> be so glad. Um, and if you have any suggestions on books or anything, if you've enjoyed doing this, this uh, thing, or you have topics, I'm doing a list of topics once a week. For those that don't know, I have a podcast um, and I, and I do a, a blog that correlates with it. And usually the podcast is a little bit more in depth. Um, and just to give you a heads up, <laughs> Um, I, I do have a, a running list of topics that I do, and a lot of the topics that I address are pertaining to the movement that I came out of, and sometimes they're personally based. I did one this past week that was personally based, but I do a lot of the topics that are um, that are discussing the things in the movement that I was that I was in, Word of Faith, NAR, and then sometimes I'll cover some current topics going on, but um, this week... In case you're interested, uh, this week I'm actually going to be talking about um, the the account that John G. Lake has in his books, um, and that there are in other books that he talked about the plague dying on his hands when he was in South Africa, and uh, I'm going to be talking about that. So. Uh, if you're interested, feel free to tune in to the blog and to the podcast. You can I, I post it on my personal page, so you can find it there. And then if you like it, you can subscribe and stay tuned. But yeah, we'll be talking about that. I've done some research on it, and um, should be interesting what we can what we can find out. 
And uh, I would encourage you, um, just as that example, um, and then I'm going to go. This is getting late, but um, as just as a side note with that, I came up in this in the church I was part of uh, for almost 20 years, and when I was in Bible college, uh, I had to take a course called God's Generals, and the textbook was the textbook that was used. The textbook, <laughs> air quotes. The textbook that was used was Robert Slaredon's book, God's Generals, the first volume. And um, that was the textbook. And um, so I heard about John G. Lake. I heard about, I mean, Smith Wigglesworth was one of the people I looked up to, and now I really cringe at some of the why. But John G. Lake was one I heard a lot about, and some people really looked up to him and, um, and, respected him and, and really um, put him on a pedestal and, and looked up to him as a man of God. Oh my goodness. Um, if you do some digging and if you're, uh, if you're willing to have your um, opinion checked at the door with some of the things about some of these, these men and women that are sp sp said to be generals of God and nobody's perfect. I get that. But, um, there's some verifiable information such as with Lake that is disturbing. Um, so I would encourage you to, to do some looking and even finding some people that have done research and listen to the videos and, and check it, check it for yourself. Um, and don't put these people on a pedestal. They're human, they're fallible. Um, and we should not be doing that. We should be looking to Christ for our encouragement, for our hope. We should be looking to, uh, to Christ for um, encouragement. We should be going to the Word of God to build us up, to encourage us. We do not need to, to be encouraged or build ourselves up necessarily. We can be encouraged by other people, but we don't need to build ourselves up based on these, these generals that when you start looking at their history, it is really, really, really sketchy. And uh, there's things that are not being told to us it's being hidden and covered up and kind of painted in a, they're being painted in more of a, a positive light. So I'm going to be talking about the bubonic plague or the plague, whatever, what it was called. I won't give it away, but the plague, if you're familiar, plague that the alleged story that um, John G. Lake uh, recounted in one of his writings and it was passed down and Laird and his talk about and other people, Gordon Lindsay and such in their books uh, but where the plague died in his hands. Let's see if that happened and see um, if we can do some critical thinking on that and, and put some puzzle pieces together. So I hope you found this helpful and I look forward to being on here with you again next time. Have a great night.